All right, so my talk's going to be about um, the systemic consequences of brachycephalic syndrome. And what I mean by that, I'll be serving two roles. So I'll be serving the role of speaker. I'll also be serving the role of translator. There's a lot of jargon. Okay, systemic means we're going to talk about every possible body system we can get to in the time allotted. And I had to leave at least three out or we'd be here all day long. Okay? Any one of these systems, the effects we could have spent easily two or three hours on uh, and not done a, a comprehensive job. So by systemic, I mean the breathing problems that so many brachycephalic dogs have, not all of them, but many of them have, okay, is often thought of as exactly that, a breathing problem. My bulldog is a good breather, breather that one's a, a bad breather. Okay? We think of it as a respiratory issue and we need to stop doing that. It affects every aspect of their health. Okay? So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about are the consequences of those repetitive airway obstructions and the challenge they have to inspiration and what that leads to in other organ systems. Okay? All right, so just a brief introduction. I'm gonna be talking first about systemic inflammation. Okay? What I mean by that is if we have an injury, say we're bitten by a uh, stinging insect, and we have a focal area of inflammation at the side of the bite. Okay, we're all familiar with local focal inflammation. Here I'm talking about body-wide, low-grade, smoldering inflammation, okay, which lies behind a lot of the chronic disease problems in all vertebrates, not just dogs, not just cats, not just ourselves, all of them this low-grade chronic inflammation. If you want to think of what systemic inflammation feels like, think back to the last time you've had the flu. What's different about the flu versus having a cold? A cold, the inflammation is largely restricted to your nasal passage and your sinuses. You don't get that whole body achiness, the muscle and joint pain that comes with the flu. The flu is a much more systemic inflammation. You're having signs everywhere. You just hurt all over. You can't really localize it to one spot. Okay? We'll be talking about obesity. That can be linked to brachycephalic syndrome as well. Cardiovascular disease. Lots we could do there. I'm going to focus on two things. Hypertension, increased blood pressure, and increased blood clotting. A risk of having what we call hypercoagulability, a clotting system that's overactive. Talk about a few electrolyte disorders that we've discovered in these breeds, and then summarize it. And I'll try to put it into context about what could we do as far as disease screening, about husbandry practices, about breeding uh, protocols, and how can we do this, how can we use the information we've got in the last two years to improve our approach to caring for breeding, preserving these breeds, okay? All right, I largely come at this from a bulldog perspective. When I say bulldog, I mean the English bulldog. If bulldog's good enough for the AKC, it's good enough for me. There's bulldogs, okay? But I also take care of a great many French Bulldogs. And I am happy to do everything we're doing with the English with the French, if you'd like. Okay? Because when Dr. Sturgis and Dr. Dickinson are done in the operating room, they come to me. Okay? And many of my favorite patients of all time uh, are the brachycephalic dogs that they've brought to me. And I spend endless hours in ICU building various devices for brachycephalic dogs to keep their mouth open when they're waking up from anesthesia or to keep them in a, little sling, in a little sling so they don't damage their surgical site. It's a big part of my day. It's my brachycephalic MacGyver moments. That's what I get to do, okay? All right, but I need to provide some context on what we're actually talking about, okay? I'm gonna be mentioning, making reference to obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, or the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, OSAS, okay? Those are largely synonymous, used interchangeably. And it's a human condition that's, that's very similar to brachycephalic syndrome in dogs, okay? We have recurrent episodes of airway obstruction, hypoxemia, the blood oxygen levels get too low, and arousal or awakening during sleep. Ordinary sleep should be a, a fairly uniform pattern of cycles of REM and non-REM sleep, okay? And species differ into the length of those cycles, how much is spent in each phase, okay? But for a dog, one dog's sleep pattern should be very similar to another dog's sleep pattern. Same for humans. Those are constantly being interrupted and disrupted by the blood oxygen levels dropping, secondary to these obstructions. What's different about obstructive sleep apnea, 
the version we see in dogs, which is brachycephalic syndrome, is how much these animals are compromised while they're awake. Okay? Yes, people with obstructive sleep apnea are having many periods of airway obstruction while they sleep, but unlike our brachycephalic dogs, they're not obstructing on a hot day and collapsing. Okay? That's not part of this disease in people. The canine version that we see is actually quite a bit more severe and that we have animals who are compromised while they're awake and alert. Okay. So what we have are these nocturnal respiratory interruptions, which as I mentioned, cause sleep fragmentation and what they call daytime hypersomnolence. They're sleepy during the day. Okay. Has anyone not seen a brachycephalic dog do that <laughs> during the day? I've gone to see Nancy and the folks from uh, BCNC at shows at Solano uh, Fairgrounds uh, at, uh, where did we go last year, Napa, uh, went to a couple of these shows and I love walking around and seeing the Bulldogs in their crates because you see some of them in their crates doing that. <laughs> There's 200 other dogs in this arena, okay? A dog who's getting a good night's sleep should be just going crazy with everything there is to see and smell and encounter, okay? But you see some of them are so tired they're just falling asleep on their feet, okay? which some of you would do if we gave this lecture after lunch. Okay? It's okay to do that after you had a big meal. It's not normal to be doing that 11 o'clock while you're standing upright. Okay? So that's daytime hypersomnolence. And then the hemoglobin desaturation, the pigment that carries the oxygen isn't carrying enough, and we have repetitive but transient. It resolves. It happens and then it self-resolves. Okay? Repetitive transient periods of low oxygen and high carbon dioxide. Okay? If you want to know what that feels like, try to hold your breath for the next five minutes. Okay. And so here, if we look at this is a, a polysomnogram. This would be a sleep study as they do in people, where they have a little uh, device at the uh, nasal prongs where they can measure airflow. And you see airflow in and out, and then a period of obstruction, no flow. And if they have a pulse oximeter detecting the saturation of their hemoglobin, we'll see that number drop well below 90, okay. which is clearly abnormal. Okay. Normal airflow, both through the mouth and through the uh, nostrils, okay, obstructed. And part of what I'll mention here is the idea that this big base of the tongue can be a big part of why they obstruct while they're asleep, particularly if they're sleeping on their back. Okay. Can be made worse uh, if alcohol is ingested before bedtime. I think we've probably all had a roommate at one point or another who was snoring their head off because they had one too many. In bulldogs, uh, they are a very well described model of naturally occurring obstructive sleep apnea in dogs. Okay. Naturally occurring mean we don't have to do anything experimentally to make this happen. It happens on its own. It's naturally occurring. Okay. And Joan Hendricks is a colleague of ours at University of Pennsylvania. And back in the 80s, she did some really pioneering work documenting that bulldogs don't just snore. They aren't just noisy sleepers. They're obstructing sleepers. Okay? And that's important because not everyone who snores is obstructing. There are snorers and there are people with sleep apnea. There's a lot of overlap, but they're not the same thing. Okay? And she documented these recurrent obstructive episodes during rest, that there was this low oxygen occurring and that their sleep was being fragmented based on EEG, which was mentioned in one of the earlier talks, is monitoring brain waves. Not only can we monitor for signs of seizure activity, we can also use the EEG to document what phase of their sleep cycle they're in and when it's being fragmented. Okay? Now, we know what happens in bulldogs. We presume or assume that it happens in many of the other breeds, okay? but not all of them. Okay? There's almost nobody that thinks this happens in the boxer. Okay? The boxer is a brachycephalic breed that almost never gets brachycephalic syndrome. In the last 13 years, our hospital has done hundreds upon hundreds of brachycephalic surgeries. Two boxers have had their palate shortened in that time. And I found that fascinating. I went through the record and I said, they didn't need their palate shortened. Why did you do that? Okay. When you look at what the problem was with their breathing, there was a clear explanation for why they were having difficulty breathing. And it seemed incredibly unlikely it had anything to do with their palate. Okay. So I wouldn't say all brachycephalic breeds, but many. So how does this come about? How does brachycephalic syndrome come about? Well, when we bred these dogs to shorten the muzzle, okay, we shortened many but not all of the bony structures 
except the mandible. The lower jaw didn't cooperate, so we have prognathism. Okay. That's a good thing. That's part of why they're still alive. Okay. If they didn't have the prognathism and the mandible is shortened too, the base of their tongue would be so much farther back that almost none of these dogs could survive a night's sleep. Okay, so people often call me and talk about their breeding plan to get the teeth back in alignment and get the mandible the same length as the maxilla. I said, please don't do that. Okay, you cannot put the base of the back of the tongue farther back into that throat. There isn't room. Okay, what we do know is that their nostrils are small. We call that stenotic nares. Okay, and they have an elongated soft palate. Now, those two features are the ones that get the most press. Those are the most widely publicized. Okay? I'm going to take my dog in, I'm going to get a Neri's revision, I'm going to get a stephlectomy where they shorten the soft palate. Okay? But that's only part of the picture. Okay? We also see hypoplastic trachea, a trachea that's small and narrow. Okay? That causes increased resistance to flow in and out. One of the acquired aspects is there's some laryngeal saccules that should be concave in, but they become convex and pouch, pooch out. Okay, and that narrows the airway as well. Okay, they also have excessive bony turbinates in the nasal passages. We call those ethnoid turbinates back here. We have these fine bony structures in the nose, and when we shorten the muzzle, the outside bones cooperated and shortened. Okay, the inside bones, not so much. Just went farther back, so there's crowding. And people are, we have routine surgical procedures to deal with these two aspects. Okay. And additional surgical procedures are being uh, developed, for example, to deal with the ethnoid turbinate. So some of our friends in Europe using a, a laser device to try to reduce the amount of bony tissue in the back of the nasal passages. Okay. It's called laser-assisted laser turbinectomy, or LATE. Okay. What we're working on instead is this other aspect that's been underappreciated, this thick tongue base. Okay. This tongue base, this portion right here, as I showed in the picture of the people, can come back, contact the soft palate, and cause near total obstruction. Okay. So our own work is focused on reducing the volume of that tongue base. I would like it to follow that contour of the line in the middle, okay. not that line. Okay. Nice thing about that is if people want to keep showing their dogs, there are no points associated with the tongue. I can do anything with the tongue. It does not affect their ability to show this dog. I can remove the tongue. It's grand champion. Okay? All right. So, uh, my friends at Bulldog Club of Northern California have been helping me with that work. Eric Johnson, one of our radiologists, and I have developed a couple different techniques to uh, identify the thickness and volume of the tongue by some non-invasive methods like ultrasound from the underside of the tongue. So we're writing up that work. First, we have to figure out how big is too big and make sure that those that, who have the largest tongues are also suffering the most from brachys phallic syndrome. And then eventually we have a way, uh, non-invasively, to shrink the volume of the tongue. And the same way that they do in people, it's an outpatient procedure actually in people. They rub a little lidocaine on your tongue, go ah, zap, 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 go home. Okay. So we're hoping to get to that same stage with that. It's been a long haul. We thought we'd already be doing it by this time uh, this year. Uh, but it looks like it's going to take a little bit more work before we're ready to go. Oxidative stress. Okay? We talk about superfoods and antioxidants and free radicals. Okay? Oxidative stress is when the amount of free radicals being produced exceeds our ability to, to detoxify them. Okay? It's going stale. Okay? So these are our patients slowly going stale. Okay? Coagulation, blood clotting, breaking down those clots, platelet activation, being overly um, exuberant with clotting responses occurs. Okay, it's tied into obesity as well. And then here you see endothelial dysfunction. The inner lining of the blood vessels is really an important cell type to coordinate communication between one organ, another, between components of the blood and the tissues that they're bathing. Okay, it's a really important cell layer. We call that the endothelium, and it becomes dysfunctional. This author has an interesting way of spelling systemic, okay? But we have this system-wide inflammation. They also get metabolic dysregulation. They have trouble processing carbohydrates. They behave very much like a pre-diabetic, okay? Someone who's having trouble with controlling their blood sugar. They aren't overtly diabetic, 
but they don't uh, tolerate carbohydrates very well. Okay? And these are the systemic consequences. Okay? All right, this idea of systemic inflammation. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome in people is associated with systemic inflammation. Okay? And they document that by noticing elevations in cytokines. So I mentioned local inflammation, this swelling, the pain, the local heat, the redness, all the signs that we think of of a tissue being inflamed, that's all being coordinated by these proteins we lovingly call cytokines. Okay? So that's all cytokine means, these inflammatory proteins that are in charge of that whole process of inflammation and tissue repair. Okay? Well, they're elevated in obstructive sleep apnea in people. Two classic ones are one we call tumor necrosis factor alpha and one called interleukin-6. And what's interesting is these levels are elevated in people with sleep apnea, but if you treat them with CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, sleeping with one of these masks on their face, those levels go down. Okay. And what I find even more fascinating than just increased levels is this disruption in the normal circadian pattern that happens. Normally in people would be this dark black line. The tumor necrosis factor levels are quite low during the day. Eight would be eight o'clock in the morning, noon, four in the afternoon, zero would be midnight. Okay. Very low during the day, and then we have this big nocturnal peak. Okay. In obstructive sleep apnea patients, we see a blunted peak at night, and this abnormal peak that shouldn't be there at 11 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Now what that means is that right before lunch, these obstructive sleep apnea people Folks, patients are getting very sleepy. Okay, doing that. You look the next time you have a morning meeting. There's some people who are saying they're just tapping their finger because they want to end because they're super hungry. And then there's the person doing that. Okay? That would be suspicious because tumor necrosis factor makes people very sleepy and animals very sleepy. If we take purified tumor necrosis factor and inject it, this is usually in medical students. Medical students are amazing. They'll volunteer to, to do anything a professor has asked them to do. If I worked at the medical school, I could tell the class, I'd like to inject you all with tumor necrosis factor and you can tell me if you feel sleepy. The students will say, sure. Okay. If I ask our students, I got a new CBC machine. Can I have one mil of blood from your dog to see if the machine works? No, it's my dog. <laughs> can I inject you with tumor necrosis factor? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> all right, so one of, the cons one of the systemic effects would be this excessive daytime sleepiness. Okay. I'll give you an example. Here's my friend. That. Okay. This is about 11.30 in the morning. And this bulldog is that and then goes down. Tries to take a little nap. That lasts about five minutes. He snores, obstructs, wakes back up, gets up, and he's back to this. Okay. This is a healthy dog who came to help me with the, the work that we're doing. Okay. He's not a patient that's in ICU. He's just hanging out in ICU because that's where I am. I don't want him to be around me. I don't want him sitting in the wards by himself. I want him you know, here with me. So he's actually just here hanging out. He's not admitted to the hospital as a patient. He's here because they're helping me with the study. And he's asleep on his feet at 11 o'clock in the morning. There are four other dogs in the room while he's doing this. Okay. That's not a bulldog thing. That's not normal for my dog. That's abnormal. Okay. That's not how dogs behave. Okay. All right. So we see this in increase in what's also called acute phase proteins. This is a, a primitive portion of our immune system that we share with our dogs. We also share it with lobsters and crayfish. It's a very primitive portion. Uh, these uh, early markers of uh, disease uh, tissue injury. Okay. They go up um, with obstructive sleep apnea. They go down when you put patients on CPAP. And importantly, they correlate with disease severity. You want to be able to tell the mild patients with mild disease from patients from severe disease. Anesthetizing brachycephalic dogs is not something we take lightly. Okay. The risk of, of, of post-anesthesia uh, pneumonia, even if you only focused on that one complication, is significant enough that you should approach anesthetizing these dogs very cautiously. Okay? So, should we intervene early? Should we make the recommendation that every brachycephalic dog should have brachycephalic surgery? 
period, because of these systemic consequences. Okay. I would be reluctant to recommend that. There's a portion of me that wants to say yes. Okay. You're born, what day are we gonna trim your palate and, and open up your nostrils? Okay. I have to admit, there's a portion of me that wants to do that. But the anesthesia, as I said, is not an inconsiderable risk. And we have to make sure that when we add up the pros and cons, that we're coming up with a recommendation that's truly in the dog's best interest. Not one individual dog, all the dogs. Unfortunately, it's not a black and white issue. And we haven't come to the point where we feel comfortable making a uniform recommendation. Okay? But we're working on coming up with a staging program where we can say who needs the surgery now, even though they don't snore. We, we don't see them having collapsing episodes and difficulty breathing on warm days. All right. So that was systemic inflammation. Moving on to obesity. We know that approximately 70% of people with obstructive sleep apnea are obese. Okay. And for a long time, it was thought that obesity is leading to the obstruction. Okay. But then, as, as so often happens, some clever person decides, well, what if we flip it on its head? What if it's actually the other way around? They had sleep apnea, and that's why they're becoming obese. And now it looks like it's bi-directional. I mentioned cytokines. There's also these proteins of a similar nature that are released from fat cells. Okay, which fat cells are called adipocytes. So these proteins we call adipokines. Okay. And the most important one is leptin. Leptin, 20 years ago, was going to revolutionize the world. They figured out that leptin controls appetite and satiety. And every pharmaceutical company on the planet said, oh my goodness, we're going to be able to make a leptin analog and people will never be hungry again. Okay. It's going to be the number one profitable drug of all time. Okay. Turns out, no. People who have uh, obesity related to kinds are resistant to leptin, largely. Okay. So that was billions of uh, R&D down the tubes. Okay. So it does control, uh, regulate body weight, appetite control, and how, what your metabolic rate is. But it also plays a role in control of ventilation, control of breathing. Okay? And in humans with obstructive sleep apnea, this leptin, this protein, is a better predictor of where, whether that patient, when they're awake, is going to have a high CO2 level than their body weight is. Okay? And we get into a vicious cycle, okay? where obesity, since this is released from fat cells, leads to higher leptin levels. They become leptin resistant. They develop increased visceral fat. It gives them a predisposition to obstructive sleep apnea. Okay? They have the apnea and intermittent hypoxemia. That makes your leptin go up. You get more leptin resistant, get more obese, and around and around we go. And their CO2s get higher and higher every year. Okay? And their body weight goes up. Okay? And they're trapped in this vicious cycle. Okay? Do we think it's happening in uh, brachys phallic dogs? Well, this is a paper that uh, I wrote with, uh, one of my, with my graduate student. Uh, those of you have, who are part of our Bulldog projects know him affectionately as Troy. Okay. So Troy and I wrote this paper, and this was with a group of dogs we were working with in, in uh, Western Europe, in France and Belgium. And we were comparing brachycephalic dogs with um, non-brachycephalic breeds as the controls, dolichocephalic and mesocephalic dogs. And what we found is, yes, there's a difference in their blood gases. Their carbon dioxide when they're awake is higher. Okay. So is their bicarbonate level. Okay. What isn't shown on this slide is that the body mass index, or body condition score, is higher in the brachycephalics than our control dogs. They're small groups. You don't want to read too much into that. But we may very well have a leak if we go back to that morbidly obese bulldog that was in the picture. Okay. Is that simply them overfeeding the dog and not getting in enough exercise? Or has this dog been in a vicious cycle? because of its obstructive sleep apnea. I think you need to entertain both possibilities. Okay. Okay. So obesity, systemic consequence that we have to consider. Cardiovascular disease, okay. huge problem in people. People with obstructive sleep apnea, much higher rates of heart disease and heart attacks. Okay. And the link is supported by epidemiological studies of all kinds. Okay. It's really not controversial whether there is a link. There is. Diverse factors, lots of contributing things, that elevated sympathetic tone, that high, that rush of adrenaline they get every time they partially wake up okay, is contributing. Okay. And then that endothelial layer, that inner lining of the blood vessels that becomes dysfunctional is contributing as well. 
And certainly if you're talking about a blockage of the coronary arteries, it can, there'd be a big concern if your blood's clotting too easily. Yeah. I'm going to focus on hypertension, blood pressure that's too high. 40% okay. of these people with obstructive sleep apnea have systemic hypertension. That paper from Western Europe that Troy and I did, that I just showed you a couple slides ago. Okay. One of the things we looked at besides the blood gases was blood pressure. And the brachycephalic dogs are significantly higher in their blood pressure than the other dogs. Okay. 30, 40, 30 to 40% of hypertensive patients, patient goes in to see their internist. Okay. They're found to be hypertensive. If you look at that group and screen them for obstructive sleep apnea, 30 to 40% of them will have sleep apnea that they didn't know about and their doctor didn't know about. Okay. Uh, but only recently have we figured out that they're causally related. Because we have to make sure that that's not what's called an epiphenomenon. That there's something else, some third thing that causes both hypertension and sleep apnea. We want to know if it's only two things and they're related, not three things and we only know about two of them. Okay. So now we can say they're causally related. Okay. We've actually seen this in a dog model okay, from back in 1996. They made a model of obstructive sleep apnea where they kept partially waking up these dogs as they were asleep. It's one of those studies where I guess I'm glad we know what they found. I'm also glad I'm not the one who had to do it, um, making these dogs wake up over and over and over again. And in the dog, it leads to hypertension, leads to high blood pressure. And you'd think that it would be while they're asleep. And it is here. The blood pressure goes up substantially. These are by one to two weeks after a month of doing this, their blood pressure has gone from up 10 millimeters of mercury. You think, well, that makes sense. They're having this rush of adrenaline every time they partially wake up. They'd be hypertensive. What's in interesting is that it's worse when they're awake, that their blood pressure is higher during the day when you do this. And they're not having any airway obstructions during the day. Okay? And it turns out that it's not the sleep being fragmented that's causing them to be hypertensive. It's the recurrent drop in their blood oxygen level that's leading to this hypertension. And it can be severe. This isn't a human. Uh, no, I take it back. Uh, this is the dog model. Okay. It's coming along. Arterial blood pressure should be like ours. It should not be 250 over 100. It should be 120 over 70. These are screamingly high blood pressures. Okay. And treatment with CPAP tends to normalize it. If you prevent the hypoxemia from occurring, the blood pressure will come down if you catch it early enough. So lots of mechanisms, this increase in sympathetic tone, mostly due to the, the low blood oxygen that keeps happening. Okay. You have this loss. I talked about the loss of the normal diurnal rhythm in these inflammatory cytokines. We also have a disruption of the diurnal rhythm in adrenaline and what we call catecholamines. Okay. That endothelial layer becomes dysfunctional. They have oxidative injury. They also, because their oxygen keeps going down, start making more red blood cells and their packed cell volume, PCV or hematocrit. The amount of red cells in their blood goes up. Okay. Well, that's making their blood thicker and more viscous. It's going from Gatorade towards maple syrup. Okay. And when you try to send blood that's viscous around the circuit, you're going to get a higher pressure. So that's contributing to the hypertension as well. They get some hormonal activation. They start retaining salt and water. It's going to make their hypertension worse. And then what we found is that they all ha almost uniformly have low magnesium levels. And magnesium is one of these elements that we tend to ignore. Okay. About 80% of North Americans don't get enough magnesium. Hate to break it to you. But Ed, Ed out of 10 in the room, you need to eat some green leafy vegetables. Okay. This is, it's not just that we don't eat enough green vegetables. All our magnesium comes from chlorophyll. So it's the green vegetables that have the magnesium in it. Okay. One, Americans don't eat enough of those. And two, the soil on our continent, on, on the North American continent, is very low in magnesium. So even when we grow them, they don't have very good magnesium levels. Okay. We found the dogs have, brachycephalic dogs have low magnesium levels. The other issue would be this hypercoagulability, this increased clotting. We said that's a big concern in humans with obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. We see increased uh, clotting protein levels. Okay. The platelets, the little cells that form the blood clots, are overactive. 
Okay, and some of the activators of those platelets are increased. And it's not just that they're overactive, they're actually forming small bits of clot. And we know that from what's called a D-dimer level. A D-dimer level tells us that a clot is formed and then the body has broken it down. And when it clips up that clot, we get these little uh, bits of remnant um, peptides that we call D-dimers. And those levels are increased and they correlate with the severity. The more severe the sleep apnea, the more we see these leftover bits of old clots. So we decided to look in our bulldogs and we use a, a machine called a thromboelastogram or TEG. It's got five different parameters that tell you about different aspects of the clotting system. And we compared the bulldogs, 15 bulldogs here, 24 control dogs. Okay. With each parameter it depends on whether up or down means whether they're clotting more. Okay. But in all five, the bulldogs are in the direction of clotting more. And this fifth one is called G, it's the overall clot strength. Okay. And the bulldogs are substantially, they form clots quickly, and they form clots that are very strong. Okay. And remember, these are not sick bulldogs that came to us because they have a blood clot to their leg or to their lungs. These are happy, healthy, competitive show dogs. Okay. And they are clotting very, very fast. These are, this is a level of hypercoagulability we see in dogs that have had major trauma or inflammatory diseases attacking their own red blood cells. This is substantial level of, of hypercoagulability. And you may have, we may have been looking at this right in the face forever and not realizing it. Okay. How many of you have ever taken a dog to the veterinarian, whether it's a French Bulldog, Bulldog, Pug, Boston, a break of sock dog to the vet, and you pick them back up, and they're shaved on all four legs. Has anyone not had that with one of their dogs? Okay. It's incredibly common. Okay. And what do they tell you? They go, oh, sorry about that, your dog's got really bad veins. How many have heard that really bad veins before? Okay. Yeah, almost uniformly. Okay. They don't have really bad veins, they clot really fast when you try to put the catheters in. And sometimes before you can even get the catheter hooked up, that catheter is occluded with a little clot. Okay. And they say, oh, it's not working. Oh, this dog has terrible veins. You've got to go somewhere else. Okay. That's this. Okay. The more you show up, they show up and they had to shave six different spots to get a catheter that would work, you need to be suspicious that, that your dog is clotting much more quickly than it should. Okay. And we can help investigate why that is. So if instead of just having the one little bit of vet wrap on them that they should have, okay, they got six different spots, okay, they look like they're in flash dance, okay. okay, that's what we're seeing. I don't think they have bad veins, I think they have excessive clotting, okay, and this becomes a major issue for us, because Pete and Bev will bring us these surgery patients, particularly ones with the brain tumors, where we're going to need to anesthetize them many, many times. And we're running out of vessels. Not only are we having to go catheter to catheter, the vessel starts to get firm. They start to get what's called thrombophlebitis. And they come back and like, oh, we need to anesthetize them again. And they bring them to ICU for a new catheter before anything's even been done. They're like, yeah, here. Find, a, find somewhere to put a catheter in. Okay? And that is, I think that is the result of this hypercoagulability. All right, the last thing I want to touch on is the electrolyte disorders. Okay? Electrolyte are these ionized elements that make up most of the um, chemical components of our blood and tissues. Okay? Focus on magnesium. Hypomagnesium would be, would be low blood magnesium levels. Okay? It's been poorly characterized in the setting of sleep apnea. There's one case report from last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, so the premier medical journal on the planet. Okay? And they describe a human uh, woman, obviously New England Journal is going to be a human woman, um, that keeps getting sleep apnea intermittently. And they finally started measuring a more comprehensive blood panel. They find that when she's having sleep apnea, her magnesiums are low. And when they give her magnesium, her sleep apnea goes away. Okay. And what they find is periodically, they didn't quite know at the point where they wrote up the case report, that her urine's containing excessive amount of magnesium. That she's dumping magnesium into her urine, not retaining it the way she should be, and her magnesium gets low. Now, magnesium is important for everything. 
the main currency that we use for energy is, is ATP. Okay? But anything ATP does, it needs magnesium to go with it. Okay? So there is no physiologic process that magnesium is not important for. Okay? But ATP has a really, really high affinity for it, so it can get pretty low before things start becoming awry. Right? So she gets horribly depleted, gets sleep apnea, they give her a magnesium infusion, and she gets better. And they make reference to this in a 2009 paper, it's similar. But one of the things we see with magnesium being too low is they get muscle weakness. And one of the problems would be the muscles of the pharynx get weak, and they collapse more easily. Okay? And that's what was happening with her. When she sleeps, she wasn't maintaining appropriate muscle tone uh, in her upper airways, and she would be obstructing. Okay? It becomes very soft and compliant. As she breathes in, and there's negative pressure, it just sucking in, right, like trying to suck a thick milkshake through a straw. Is it cause or effect? Is it that the magnesium is getting low and that's causing her to have sleep apnea? Or is she having sleep apnea and that's causing the magnesium to be low? Like so many things, the answer is probably both. But we decided to look in uh, two groups of bulldogs. We went back through all the clinical data that we had since we started measuring magnesium. And I compared bulldogs to the boxers. Okay. I have to thank Pete. So Dr. Dickinson's laboratory is right next door to mine. And I was walking by and he had a poster where he had the, the you know, genetic tree of brachycephaly. Okay. Here's the brachycephalic and this one's more closely related to that one, closely related to that one. So I could just stand outside our labs and look at it and say, let me go with boxers. Okay. I'm going to compare the bulldogs to boxers. They're pretty closely related. Boxer never gets brachycephalic syndrome. Okay. So let me go to that data first. And we looked. When we look at hundreds of boxers, hundreds of bulldogs, and then some historical controls that are neither, okay? Not brachycephalic dogs at all. Normal, normal dogs, the range of their serum magnesium is that dotted line there, okay? The boxers follow that almost exactly. Then you have the bulldogs. They're shifted over to a lower level, okay? None of them are up in this range, okay? Very few in this range. It's only to, when you start getting to the lower end of the magnesium, serum magnesium levels, that we have lots of them. And then they have this extra shelf, okay? Right around here is the low end of our normal range. We wouldn't expect very many dogs at all to be to that sign, okay? So when we look at our historical data, we see, wow, there have been a lot of low magnesium bulldogs. We just didn't see it because we're only seeing them one at a time. But when we look at them collectively, yeah, they're low. When we compare the, t the values of the groups, the, right here, this bar in the middle of each box is the bar that separates the top 50% from the bottom 50%. It's called the median. The bulldogs are lower, significantly lower. Okay? And over 50% of the bulldogs are below the normal range. Okay? So if I go back and I said, well, those are patients. This data that we're collecting, we, we measured those blood values because we were concerned about their health in one way or another. Okay? What if we take our friends from the Bulldog Club of Northern California? happy, healthy bulldogs, and look. Total magnesium, uniformly low. Okay? 16 dogs, 15 of them are below the normal range, or right at the lower limit of the normal range, except for one, whose family just happens to be here today. Okay. Nancy, can I talk about Jesse specifically? Sure. Thanks. So I thought that was puzzling. I thought, oh, all of them. And I got to Jesse and I said, what? So then I called Nancy. I said, you know, your dog's the only one that has a normal magnesium. And I said, we went back over the diet. She's like, yeah, that's what I'm feeding him. Oh, yeah, he also gets showstopper. We're showstopper, right? Yeah. He gets showstopper. Okay, it's a nutrient supplement. I said, okay, I don't know what that is. Go online. I'm like, yeah, that's magnesium oxide. So if you take the 15 dogs who weren't on magnesium supplementation, all of them were deficient. Okay. And Jesse uh, is in there. Where is he? He's a two. Yeah, Jesse's number eight. Okay. So that's really, really important information. Okay. This low magnesium is almost uniform. But it's really important to know that potentially with dietary supplementation, we can get it up into the normal range. We can't say that yet. If I say that, it's, I'm, I'm making the assumption that Jesse would have a low magnesium if he wasn't on Showstopper. I don't know that. But let's assume that he, he, he would be. Okay? It's plausible. 
If that's the case, then that gives us a really big, good clue about what's going on. If bulldogs had a problem with their kidneys where they can't hang on to magnesium, it wouldn't matter whether we put them on supplements. If you put them on a supplement, they'd urinate it out. So if Jesse is in fact telling us that adding some, some uh, magnesium to the diet can help get this up in the normal range, great. That tells us the problems either with the gut absorbing it or I'll, my other suspicion, which I'll get to. Okay, so that was really important information to get. Okay. So the reason I think they're low in magnesium comes back to brachycephalic syndrome. Okay. I think this is the most plausible mechanism. Okay. So here's a, a study in sheep. And they take these sheep, and for 100 minutes, they have them breathe 6% carbon dioxide so that their blood carbon dioxide levels go up. And what you see is their urine magnesium levels shoot up. Okay. So if your ca blood carbon dioxide levels go up, you will start dumping magnesium into the urine. Okay. And this is exactly what I think is happening in the brachycephalic dogs. I can't say it's true in other breeds, but I can say I think this is what's happening in bulldogs. Okay. That as they sleep and they're having their brachycephalic syndrome, and this oxygen's dropping and the carbon dioxide's rising as they're obstructing while they sleep, their kidneys start adding more and more magnesium to the urine. You do that every night, you lose a little bit more magnesium, and you get to the point where you have nearly an entire breed that's too low in magnesium. Okay? And that's not going to help their sleep apnea. Okay. All right, so the question is, do they have a higher carbon dioxide while they're sleeping? Okay? Nobody's shown that. This study that we did with the dogs in Europe was while they were awake. Yeah, it's a little higher than they're awake, but it's still in the normal range. Okay. So, slightly higher, but it's more awake. We need a marker of long-term carbon dioxide levels being too high. Okay. I can't check an arterial blood gas in a sleeping dog. They'll wake up. Okay. They'll wake up as soon as they touch the foot. I could try to be really, really sneaky, but it's not going to work out for me. Okay. So I need some marker that can tell me, has their CO2 been too high for a long time? Okay. We can do this in diabetes management. Same thing in diabetes. Instead of looking at a, you know, taking a blood test and putting it on the glucometer, that tells you what your blood glucose is right now. Okay. But your in internist will take another blood sample and look at how much glucose is stuck to your hemoglobin. Because that's a, that happens over a long period of time, this glycosylated hemoglobin. We need a marker like that. Something that tells us, has their CO2 been higher than average over the last month? Okay. So we think we're there. Okay. I think the answer is actually simple. It's chloride, which can be measured anywhere. Okay. There's no practice that does not have the ability to measure chloride, either on site or send it to their, to their lab. So here's what happens. When we looked at um, the bulldogs and boxers, the first thing we thought to look at is, oh, well, we just need to look at their bicarbonate. Because if your CO2 goes up, CO2 combines with water and it'll form bicarbonate. Okay? So we should be able to measure the bicarbonate levels. Because that's one of the compensations that happens when, you're, when your CO2 is high for a long time. Made perfect sense, rational. We look, nope, they're not different. Okay? We thought, oh, well, that's interesting. Should be, I thought. But the problem is that whole understanding of bicarbonate is based on the idea that the CO2 is up and it stays up. There's almost no research data about when it goes up and down and up and down and up and down, except for one study, which fortunately happened to be done in dogs. Okay. And what they find is that, yes, when the, bicar when the CO2 goes up, the bicarbonate goes up as well. And as soon as the CO2 goes down, the bicarbonate starts to go down. But what they also found is that when the CO2 goes up, the chloride goes down. And as the CO2 goes down, you start to fix your chloride, but it fixes much more slowly than the bicarbonate does. And then they go up and up. And you get to a point where you're constantly going CO2 up, bicarb up, chloride down. And as it resolves, those two things that went up go whoosh. The chloride tries to, it's just slower. And then they go through another night's sleep. And the chloride goes down a little bit more and partially recovers. And so what we're finding is probably the best indicator of chronic CO2 levels being too high is a chloride that's out of the normal range. It's low. And it fits the physiology best. And so we looked at the chloride. 
And we have our boxers here. Their chloride's up in the normal range. The bulldogs are significantly lower. Okay. And then when we looked at, that, that's the historical data. Then I took our 16 dogs from uh, BCNC and looked at their chloride. And it's almost uniformly low. That's sort of a form of external validation. We looked at the historical data, and then we prospectively collected data and found, yeah, it's low in these dogs. Okay, Because we want to be sure that the dogs who came to us and had their blood work done, again, they were here for a reason. We tried to exclude all the other causes for low chloride to the best that we can. If it was written in the record, we, we excluded that. Didn't include them in the data set. But let's look at the healthy dogs. Healthy dogs having a low chloride. And we think that low chloride is because um, of the CO2 going up and down and up and down and up and down. It's, it's what should happen. Okay? But I wanted to add one more level of, of questioning. I said, okay, if this is right, if the chloride's going down because the CO2 is staying high for intermittently overnight, then the dogs, no matter what brachycephalic breed you are, not just bulldogs, if you come to our hospital, to have the brachycephalic surgery, have your, your nostrils opened up, have your palate trimmed, have the sacules resected. If you're here for that, then you should have the lowest chloride of all. Okay? Because you, in theory, should be the most severely affected. Okay? And that's exactly what happens. If we look at the surgery patients, the boxers are the highest, bulldogs next are lower, largely out of the normal range, and the patients who are coming for brachycephalic surgery are the lowest of all. That starting to build a better case that chloride is going to be the holistic marker we need for how much their CO2 is staying up while they're sleeping. So if that holds up, we have additional tests we want to do to compare their actual lung function while they sleep to the chloride levels in individual dogs. But if that holds up to scrutiny, okay, then that becomes a very powerful tool. I could have already told you if these dogs were having a high CO2 when they sleep, because I have an entire sleep research lab. I can measure their pulmonary function, I can measure the endothelial function. My whole lab is built to measure that in bulldogs. Okay? There's one other place in the world that can do that, it's in Belgium. Even if both of us ran 24-7, 365 screening dogs, we'd get through tens and dozens a year. Okay? We need something that can be done anywhere, that is holistic, takes all the factors into account, okay, and correlates with the severity. Okay, and I think chloride is going to be it. Okay, so it becomes an important new marker for severity staging. Okay, also becomes a potential screening measure for breeding programs. Oh, you'd like to breed your dog to mine? Let's see its chloride. Okay, 106. Uh, what else you got? It's potentially very powerful because the chloride can be measured anywhere. Okay? It's taking all the factors into account. But as Dr. Dickinson pointed out, be careful what you wish for. You start breeding based on one sole parameter, okay? and you may get an unintended consequence uh, that you wish had not come along for the ride. Okay? So I don't want you to leave here saying, I'm not going to breed my dog until I have a chloride from everybody. There's work to be done. But it's very encouraging. And it could make a huge difference. And it's something that can be done anywhere, almost any time. It also gives us a way to look at treatment. Right now, what do we do? We do the surgery. We, we trim that soft palate. We open up the nares the best we can. Maybe we resect the saccules. Okay. And then whether it works or not, we ask you. Do you seem better? She seem better? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, good, it worked. Okay. We don't know. They could be just as hypercapnic when they sleep. CO2 could be just as high, the O2 could be just as low, because we don't have good objective measures about which procedures work, which don't work well, when do they work, and when don't they. Okay. So what we want to look, unfortunately, nobody ever, once they have their brachycephalic surgery, nobody ever brings it back to our hospital so we can recheck the chloride. I thought, I'm going to go back. I'll take these dogs. I'll look at their chloride after surgery. Yeah, there are no chlorides after surgery. Okay. But now we know, and now we can start asking. It doesn't, you don't have to come all the way back up to Davis, but if you get it done, if you're going to have this done, can you get a chloride check before the surgery in a month, two months after? We'll pay for it, and we can see. Also, we've talked about this procedure I'm working on to reduce the volume of the tongue. If that's going to be a benefit, I'm going to want to see the chloride coming up into the normal range after we do it. 
So we need these kind of objective measures to say, should we keep carrying on what we're doing, or is it not working? Okay. Is there a better way of doing this? Can we make these dogs healthier? Can we make the surgery better? Okay. Is there an alternative to surgery, something minimally invasive that could work? And that's what we're working on. All right, so here's what I covered. Systemic inflammation, obesity, two types of cardiovascular risk, high blood pressure and excessive clotting, these magnesium and chloride deficiencies, okay? Things that I had to leave out, lung injury, people with obstructive sleep apnea get recurrent tiny bits of lung injury every night, and it adds up over time, okay? We're looking into that in dogs. Gastrointestinal disease, a huge subject. With hiatal hernias, they have inflammation of their proximal bowel, okay, that we need to address. Okay. We're working on that. So part of our team include Phil Mayhew in surgery, Stan Marks, our gastroenterologist. The three of us have tons of work going into to trying to build a better proximal intestine for brachycephalic dogs. Okay. Uh, new treatment development, I talked about um, the tongue volume reduction that we're working on. We're also working with a, an MD down in the South Bay in Campbell, at Good Samaritan Hospital. Uh, that's developing new implants that can keep the tongue from folding back, keep the airways from obstructing. We want to be able to have a way to validate whether those are going to be useful for dogs. So that's uh, Lionel. He's been a big help to us. And I just want to say that I've, the work I've done over the years is lovingly put under this blanket term I call the Bulldog Health Initiative. And the idea here is that I turned 45, figured I've got 20 years until I'm going to retire. So I wanted something all-encompassing for those 20 years. I want some single unifying thing that I work on for the remaining two decades. Okay? And given how much brachycephalic work I did, I do on a daily basis, I decided bulldogs were going to be it. Because okay? bulldogs are getting gypped. Bulldogs are a 25 kilogram dog breed. They should live 14 years. They live about 12. They're getting robbed of two years. So in the next 20 years, we want to get them back. Okay? Everything we do in the English Bulldog should help with husbandry, care, health, and the other brachycephalic breeds as well, perhaps except the boxers. Boxers have a totally different set of problems. Okay? Every breed has its problems. Even the mixed breed dogs have their own problems. Okay? But we're focused on the ones that seem to be common to brachycephalic breeds. We want to come up with the best practices, everything from nutrition, to every husbandry aspect, improving their sleep quality. We want to get those two years back over the next 20. And we call that the Bulldog Health Initiative. We've got a huge team, radiologists helping us sort out how, how big is too big for a tongue. Uh, we have the paraflex, we can measure their endothelial function. Uh, we've got the pulsion system, I can measure how low their blood oxygen level gets while they're asleep. Uh, this is the, the plethysmograph. That's Spencer sitting in the box. Okay. This is a, a device we had built for us in Germany. It just got shipped over last month, where to measure their lung function, how much obstruction they're having, involves them standing or sitting in a crate for 15 minutes. There's nothing else going on but Spencer sitting in the crate. That's it. It's completely non-invasive. Hi, Spencer. Get in the crate. Sits in the crate. Close the door. 15 minutes later, we've got some beautiful data. Okay. Um, we have the, the Vapotherm device, a way of, of after surgery providing the equivalent of CPAP to try to minimize the risk in that post-operative period. Um, and it all started with Bogart here. Bogey is the wonder bulldog. This was a 12-year-old bulldog who had itchy ears, came in to get an ear canal ablation, got aspiration pneumonia, ended up on the ventilator, developed a type of lung failure called ARDS. The number of dogs we'd had that ever survived ARDS, I can count on zero fingers. And I've been doing this 20 years. Never. I had, did not have a survivor of that disease. Okay. He came off the ventilator. He survived ARDS. Then he had a cardiac arrest. And CPR got him back. Okay. This dog's immortal. <laughs> There's nothing that can harm this dog. This was last month. He just came for a visit because his skin was flaring up again. He's a little itchy. You meet dogs like this that are so stoic, and these dogs are incredible. They're so stoic. We have some other breeds that are screaming when we even start clipping for a catheter. 
The builders are like, oh, you got you to shave me in six places? All right. Okay. And how can you not love a dog with that kind of personality? Okay. So everything we do is under this Bulldog Health Initiative. Whatever your brachycephalic breed is, we're here to help. Okay. All right, so I want to say thanks. I cannot ever talk about this subject without thanking my friends at Bulldog Club of Northern California. Okay. They have been like family um, and just a, an amazing uh, group to partner with. Uh, Motherload, also big contributors. We have to be thankful to Motherload as well. Northern California Bulldog Rescue, we're thankful to them. Center for Companion Animal Health that funds us. American Kennel Club helps pay for one of my graduate students and all these people. It's, it's a huge team and they all make really important contributions. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Ah, that's a good question. It wasn't. It is on ours. Because in 2008, Would you repeat the, question? the question is whether magnesium is standard on a chem chemistry panel. So if your vet submits one, are they going to get a magnesium level? And also the same question for chloride. Chloride, yes. There is no chemistry panel where you'll not get a chloride level back. Okay? Magnesium is not routine. Okay? And it w in, until 2008, it wasn't on our chemistry panel. But our lab sent out an email saying, hey, our service contract is up. We can change what's on the chemistry panel. What do you guys want? I sent this obnoxious email that was just the word magnesium repeated about 200 times, a whole page of it. And I'm not joking about that. Okay. And so they said, oh, okay. So they put magnesium on there. Um, magnesium comes in two forms. You can use your me measure all of it that's there in the blood because some of it's bound to protein, some of it's free. And then some of it's ionized, just magnesium with a double positive charge. Okay. The total measures it all. There's a group of people that think you really need to measure the ionized form. They're wrong. Okay. And they've been wrong for 20 years. Okay. You either need to measure the total or you need to measure the ratio between the two. The ratio, having both of them is the best way to go. Okay, because when dogs get depleted in magnesium, this ratio actually goes up. Okay. Goes up in rats, goes up in cats, goes up in people. Okay, and so what you see of the total amount of magnesium and you keep defending the ionized portion. So the ionized is taking a bigger, bigger fraction of the total that's there. Because the ionized is really important. That's what's the most biologically active. You want to defend that. But you're doing that at the, at the expense of the other forms. So the ratio is the most informative of all. Okay? So we measure both. And what we see in the bulldogs is they have the same ratio as a cat that's fed a diet without magnesium in it. Okay? It's low. The other thing I didn't talk about is just measuring the serum levels isn't really going to tell you for sure that a dog needs magnesium. Now, I don't want everyone to leave here and start putting your dogs on magnesium. Okay? Because if your dog were to get a urinary tract infection and you're giving it more magnesium than it needs, it can get the most horrendous kidney, uh, bladder and kidney stone from all that extra magnesium if there's an infection. So the take home message is not go buy a whole bunch of magnesium at the pharmacy and start giving it to your dogs. Okay? There's still work to be done there. Okay, we'll make a recommendation when we have all the evidence we need and can make a safe recommendation. Okay. Um, where was I going with that thought? Ah, yes. All right. Okay, so what we do, if we really want to know if a dog is, needs magnesium, is what we've done in three of the dogs uh, from BCNC, which is it's labor intensive. You come in, you have to place a urinary catheter so you can collect all the urine for 24 hours. And you give them a dose of IV magnesium. And then you measure how much makes it to the urine over the next 24 hours. If they don't need magnesium, they'll just pee it all out. If their cells are starving for magnesium, they'll hang on to it. If they hang on to more than 25% of it, it's suspicious. If they hang on to more than 50% of it, it's diagnostic. They, they are depleted in magnesium. The three dogs we've done were about 60, 75, and 95% retention. 95 retention is insane. They're hanging on to every molecule of magnesium they can get. 60% is bad, 75% is bad, but the 95% is just unprecedented. That's called parenteral magnesium tolerance testing. Okay. Now, we still need to define how variable that can be in a normal dog eating normal dog food. Okay. But if you apply the human standards, every dog we've tested that had low blood magnesium levels, this test absolutely supported that they needed magnesium. Okay. So, still working on that. Actually, 
uh, Pete and Bev Services volunteered to help us get some normal dog urine magnesium uh, levels because many of their dogs that have had spinal surgery will have a urinary catheter in because they're having difficulty urinating as well as walking. So we have a dog who's otherwise healthy, has a spinal issue, but their kidneys work and they shouldn't be magnesium depleted. So um, they're helping with that as well. So if you are taking your dog elsewhere, if you come here, yeah, you're getting a magnesium level because I'm a pest and I nag our lab until it happened. Uh, but if you go elsewhere, you're going to have to ask for it. Okay. But during this stage, if you have a dog you would like to get it checked on, um, if you were here today and in the room and can prove it, I'll run it for free. Just send it to me. Have your vet pull some serum and I'll run it. I can tell you. Um, so don't put that on Facebook. I can't afford to do 10,000 samples. Free magnesium guy, 10,000 likes. That's not what we're looking for here. But if you're here and you'd like and you're interested and you'd like to know in some of your own dogs, I'd be happy to run it. Ah, chloride. So that's a really good issue. We don't know if we need to, to fix that yet. Right now it's just a marker. There's really only this one study that just came out, huge, 15,000 human patients, that showed that the hypochloremia is contributing to the severity of the hypertension and how rapidly it progresses and that how much is taken in the diet um, has a big effect. The problem has always been is you can't give chloride, which is negatively charged, without also giving something that's positively charged. And it's been really hard. That's why we haven't known chloride was a problem for so long, because we've always blamed the sodium, which is what it usually goes with. The problem is salt. It is sodium, the sodium ion. Everyone says it's not the chloride. The chloride's just there because you need a negative charge to go with it. It wasn't, until they, it wasn't until they did this very clever study. They said it's not just the sodium. The sodium is a problem, but the, so is the chloride. If you look at the total chloride intake, when you're taking chloride with something else that's positively charged, your blood pressure is better controlled. So where we're at with that is the folks at Royal Canaan um, have support the lab as well. I should have put them up there as well. Uh, they're working on, on a, with us on the magnesium issue. And then they're going to support some pilot data on the chloride issue as well. Is should we be supplementing the chloride to try to bring it up, increase dietary chloride to bring it up into the normal range? Okay. Or is it merely a marker in these dogs? We don't know, is it a marker, is it, is it a marker that you're having trouble, or is it why you're in trouble? We have to clarify that first. Because what we could do is, if we raise the chloride, the ultimate effect would be that the, the pH, the amount of uh, hydrogen ion in their blood will increase, the pH will go down. Okay? That could be detrimental. We want to be sure it's something we need to fix and should fix before we fix it. But yes, there's tons of things. You could give them magnesium chloride, fix two birds with one stone. I don't like to say kill two birds. I don't want like to kill the birds. I fix two birds with one stone. We always need, we always need bulldogs. Ages? Ages, we're uh, really between 18 months and five years has been the cohort we've been targeting. Uh, so anybody who wants to participate can always contact me there. Um, we've had a lot of people with French bulldogs email me and say, this is so unfair. Why do you only work on the English? <laughs> I have a Frenchie. Uh, there's one guy from LA who called me daily for a week saying, I want my Frenchie to be the first dog who has the tongue reduction. I said, no. <laughs> and it was Tuesday, and I said, it's you again? No. I said, no, you're not. The English Bulldog's tongues are going to, if we do it at all, we want to be sure it's safe and it's, it's uh, useful. Um, but all the other stuff we're doing is all applicable to French Bulldogs or Boston Terriers or Pugs or whichever breaks felic breed you love. Um, if you want to get involved, there's a dozen different ways to get involved. It could be anything from coming once, get, giving a blood sample, or being part of something that's more ongoing. One other question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that not all dogs in the market have oh, let's say, yes, positive charge. Yeah. Um, what about those that have the positive charge? No, that's an interesting question. Okay. Uh, some people are sort of these silent obstructors, and they, and they, and people at least. Can say this. We know in people that uh, there's plenty of people where uh, the doctor is saying you're, you're hypertensive and your, your C-reactive uh, protein levels are off the charts. I think you might have sleep apnea. And the guy says, 
I've been sleeping in the same bed with my wife for a quarter century. I don't snore. And they said, well, I still want you to go in for this, this overnight sleep test. And they said, I'm not doing that. Okay? And then they finally badger him to the point where he or she goes and gets a sleep test. Like, yeah, you do have obstructive sleep apnea. And no, you don't snore. Your obstruction's actually so bad that you don't get the tissues vibrating to make the noise. It's the ones who don't snore who are the scariest. <laughs> So that's either very, very good news or a little concerning. But if you'd like to have them checked out, we can take a peek. For the magnesium testing, what, uh, what is needed? Just serum. Just serum in a tighter pocket? Yeah, red top tube spun down, take the serum off, and send it to us. I'll need that in writing. <laughs> um, I, Pete, can we? Yeah, we can do that. I didn't bring a card, but we can find a way to make that happen to everyone who was attending, maybe? Sure. Thanks for coming. <laughs>